Uh, really good to be back uh, to Fair Oaks Church and i um, happy to be addressing the topic of the morning. Uh, but before diving in, I just want to say that, you know, Debbie and I have always looked back fondly on the 18, month, 18 months that we uh, served as an interim ministry back in uh, 2014 and 15. I can't believe it's been that long ago. But uh, one of the things that we remember doing is, is remodeling this auditorium. And uh, we got a lot done in those 18 months. It was, it was quite, a, quite a great time. And uh, it brings uh, great joy to know that your church is, is blessed by the godly leadership of Pastor Chad and, um, and blessed by the legacy of Pastor Phil's leadership. I got to tell you, I couldn't be more proud of, of Phil and Callie Godly. I hope you appreciate them as much as I do. Yeah. So uh, you may be relieved to know up front that today's topic is neither complicated nor controversial. <laughs> uh, most all of us will nod our heads in agreement with the subject matter. Uh, the difficulty will not be agreeing with it. The difficulty will be in taking the necessary action towards solving the problem. And what is the problem? Well, it is quite simply too much of everything. Too much clutter, too much stuff, too much excess, too much of almost everything. Most all of us would agree that more is not necessarily always better. Most of us wonder how things have piled up the way they have and where our insatiable appetite for more comes from. I can tell you that every time I come back from a mission trip to the third world, be it in Mexico or Argentina or Africa, uh, and see how the vast majority of people in our world live, I come back vowing to simplify my life. I mean, I remember coming back from South America years ago, convicted about the excess in my life. I found myself staring out the window in my backyard. What was in my backyard, you ask? Four boats. Yeah, four boats. Four watercraft of different shapes and sizes. Why did I have four boats? This is the question my wife regularly asks. <laughs> and I do my best to try to explain or rationalize why all four were absolutely necessary. Uh, there was an aluminum fishing boat, uh, a very fast wakeboard boat, a canoe, which I tell Debbie doesn't really count. You know, it's just <laughs> a canoe. And then a cedar strip wooden boat that had nostalgic value. Still, I agreed I had to cut down somehow, and I agonized over the decision. I finally ended up selling the aluminum fishing boat, converting my wooden boat for fishing. And I thought I did good by cutting down on my number of watercraft by 25%. So how about if we start there? Think about what is excessive in your life. What is it that you could cut out, sell, give away, or reduce by 25% and hardly miss it at all? What would not only clear out physical space, but free up time and money that it takes to manage, store, maintain, insure, fix, accessorize, update, and so on? This will take some counter-cultural thinking. Turning our consumeristic mindset around is not as easy as we think. What would it take for us to come to a similar place as the American explorer Robert F. Byrd, famous for his expeditions to the North and South Pole? On one adventure, he spent five winter months alone while manning a meteorological station in Antarctica. There he wrote in his journal, and I quote, I am learning that man can live profoundly without masses of things. Living profoundly without masses of things. How profoundly un-American. How is that even possible? How is it that we have strayed so far from the simple but thankful life of the early pilgrims, many who came to America forming societies known as Quakers? 
close cousins, close spiritual cousins to the Quakers were the Shakers. I'm serious. There were Quakers and Shakers. And they started a dance movement that swept the New England states called the Quake and Shake. Okay, that's not true. But what is true is that these societies were centered on the values of simplicity and frugality. Not just an uncluttered life, but an uncluttered mind and soul. In fact, even today, you can visit a restored Shaker village just outside of Lexington, Kentucky. In the spirit of their lifestyle, what is known as the Shaker Town Pledge has been created for moderns like you and I to consider. Here's part of what the pledge says. Recognizing that the earth and the fullness thereof is a gift from our gracious God, and that we are called to cherish, nurture, and provide loving stewardship for the earth's resources, and recognizing that life itself is a gift and a call to responsibility, joy, and celebration, I make the following declarations. And it goes on. I declare myself to be a world citizen. I commit myself to lead an ecologically sound life. I commit myself to lead a life of creative simplicity and to share my personal wealth with the world's poor. I affirm the gift of my body and commit myself to its proper nourishment and physical well-being. I know a, a successful CEO who sees it as his responsibility as a father to his children to live out these values and to avoid spoiling his kids with wealth and with all the things that money can buy. And so ever since his kids were small, he has sought to teach them and model for them a little saying that actually goes by many titles. It's known as the Yankee Creed, or the Pilgrim Motto, or the Puritan Pledge, and it goes like this. Use it up, wear it out, make it do, do without. How about if we say that together? Can you say that with me? Use it up, wear it out, Make it do, do without. How do you think this would go over in your homes, parents? (laughs) Uh, Would you have a revolt on your hands if this became the new family mantra? Maybe, but isn't there something refreshing about the Yankee Creed? Isn't there something attractive about driving your car till it dies, wearing out your clothes, repairing tools instead of replacing them, and instead of running out to buy the newest gadget, waiting longer before we replace old technology with the latest and the greatest? I still have an iPhone 7. My daughter makes fun of me relentlessly, ruthlessly. Dad, you're, it's a dinosaur. It still works. It works for me. You know, on a deeper level, at what point do we recognize our craving for newer and better and more stuff as psychotic? Really? At what level do we see this as an unhealthy obsession that indicates a loss of touch with reality and sanity? How close are we to the guy Jesus talked about in a parable who had stockpiled his possessions and wealth, finding his identity, security, and happiness in what he owned. If you can find a Bible or brought one along today, go to the Gospel of Luke 12. We'll bring it up on the screen also, of course. But we're just going to read this little parable from Luke 12, beginning in verse 13. I'm trying to decide if I can see better with my glasses or without them. I haven't really decided yet, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out, be on your guard, he said to his disciples, against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And then he told them this parable, the ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop, and he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store all my grain and all my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared 
for yourself. This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself but is not rich toward God. There's a wake-up call for us, huh? And the one line that I hope will rattle around in our brains for a good long while is where Jesus says, life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. That is not what the good life is all about. How do we know this? Because possessions, the stuff we own, does not ultimately satisfy. How do we know it doesn't satisfy? Because once we get what we think will satisfy us, what happens? We have our eyes set on the next thing and the next and the next. And we keep building bigger barns or larger storage units. But what does it all mean when God asks us to account for our lives? It means nothing. Nothing at all. What means something is not how much we value our stuff, but how much we value God and our relationships. This is where true riches lie. Not in how much we own, but in how much God owns us, owns our hearts, owns our souls, owns every part of us, owns, yes, our possessions and our money. And a big part of this is learning the sacred art of contentment. Contentment, not in the sense of settling for the status quo, uh, nor that of not trying anymore, just whatever, that's not contentment, nor that of not seeking to make our lives better, we should be doing that, but of a pervasive happiness for the abundant life God provides for us graciously and faithfully day after day, year after year. I'm reminded of an incident that happened in Alaska several years ago. Three hunters hired a bush pilot to hunt moose in Alaska. When the pilot dropped him off in the bush, he said, I'm going to return in a week, but remember what I said last year, my plane can only carry three hunters and one moose. Yes, we know, said the hunters. Well, when the pilot returned, he found three hunters and three moose. The hunter said, well, last year we slipped you $300 and you let us load our three moose. The pilot said, well, okay, but this year the price is 500 bucks because this really puts me at risk. Well, the hunters grumbled a bit, but they pay the 500, jam the three moose aboard, the plane lumbers aloft, but can't get enough height fast enough and crashes into the trees. Well, the hunters are now scattered throughout the forest, and one shouts, hey, where are we? And one of his buddies replied, oh, about 100 yards from where we crashed last year. (laughs) I mean, isn't that the way we are? One moose is good. More moose is better. More is always better. Or is it? Let's take a look at what St. Paul says by way of personal testimony. Philippians chapter 4, a very familiar uh, passage to many of us. Uh, Philippians 4, 10 through 13. In the first verse, uh, he thanks the church for sending him a gift while he is imprisoned in a jail cell. He then expresses his surprising joy, his gratitude, his contentment for how God always provides. Take a look at this. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content In whatever the circumstances, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Wow. And then he says, I can do everything. I can do anything through him, through Christ, who gives me strength. Two key repetitive phrases here, right? I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances... And again, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And what I want to know is, how does one do that? How do I do that? How do you do that? Speaking for myself, I do not always do that very well. I'm not always a contented man. How about you? Paul says he had to learn how to be content. Learning while relying on God's strength. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. 
So specifically, in the strength and power of Christ, all things become possible. I I can do what is hard. I can endure what is difficult. Even surprise myself with resilient joy that comes from a God-given strength within. There's a couple of specific not-so-easy things that we can lift out of the text that we can do with this God-given strength. First of all, with God's uh, God's strength, we can uh, respond to the needs of others, as Paul says in verse 10. He thanks them for renewing their concern for him and sending him this this gift of money to help him uh, where he was. He's thanking them for financial support he has received from the church in Philippi while he's been in prison. And I just want to pause and encourage you, Fair Oaks Church family. I want to encourage you by telling you that every time you drop a check in the offering or go online and make a donation to the ministry of this church, you usually have no idea of how you are responding to and meeting the very real needs of other people. You have no idea. But God is doing things through your gifts that you may not know until you see the Lord face to face. Your contributions are helping this church reinvent itself into a body that is more and more becoming the church Jesus intends for us to be. One that will make a greater impact in the surrounding community and across the world. So may I encourage you in your ministry of generous giving. Second thing we can do with God's strength is to this. Be content with what we have. As Paul says again in verse 11, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. So after thanking them for responding to his needs, he sort of minimizes or plays down his needs, saying that he has learned an important life lesson, how to be content whatever his circumstances are. And as if he needs to convince us that he's not bluffing or just saying this to sound super spiritual, he reinforces his statement in verse 12 by saying he has learned how to be content in the lean times and in the abundant times. In plenty and in want. So, okay, uh, Concord, Diablo Valley, you know, modern American consumers, all. How many of you are able to to say this? How how about this? What is the next major purchase you have in mind? I want you to think about what that might be. And then tell me, is that a want or a need? (laughs) Are you saying, I want to have this or I need to have this? And are you being honest? I guess what a recent poll revealed as to the percentage of Americans who said that we buy and consume far more than we need. 82%. And I'm wondering where the joy is in that. I think we can do better. Uh, Shifting gears a bit, I remember when Larry Martin, the director of International Justice Mission, a a ministry that rescues and seeks justice for women and children who have been trafficked, spoke at uh, our church at Crosswinds uh, one Sunday, and what he said has always stuck with me. Larry said this, I believe that we are not having enough fun with what God has given to us. He has given us everything, all our resources for our joy. Don't use it for all, don't use it all for trivial stuff. Use it to liberate others and to be God's agent to others. This is fun. (laughs) This is joy. To use the good God has given us to lift people up. And I'm like, yeah, spot on. We can be generous with our finances. We can use a good portion of our money to lift others up and to build up the church to the glory of God. And there's tremendous joy in this, folks. I mean, I'm speaking uh, in just a humble way. I mean, Debbie and I have been married now for a long time. Going on 49 years, I think. And um, anyway... You know, throughout our life, even when we were poor seminary students, we we just committed to giving a a tenth of our income to the Lord, a tithe. And we wouldn't miss doing that because it gives us joy. I just want to encourage those of you who are wondering, what is this giving all about? I, I really can't afford it. I'm not into it. You know, I'll let the rich people do that. Whatever, whatever you're thinking. Um, I, I would just encourage you to to to, to give it a go and to, to consistently start giving 
back to the Lord and see if you don't find some real joy in that. It's, it's actually fun. <laughs> and uh, we wouldn't miss it. It gives us joy. But if you want another confirmation, let's get it straight from the mouth of God. Go to Matthew 6, verses 31 through 34. Jesus here is speaking, confirming what the Apostle Paul has said. He says this, So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Your Father knows what you need. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things that you need or even want will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry. Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Amen? This is the word of God who does not lie. God promises to meet all your needs and so much more. As we trust and do not worry and be generous with what the Lord God has entrusted to us. But there's another insight on this matter of contentment that we all must reckon with. And I'm going to get real, real here um, along with uh, something that C.S. Lewis said. And it's this, that neither you nor I will ever be completely satisfied nor fully content in this life ever. It's just not possible. I don't care how much money you have or how great your sex life is. (laughs) I think we're talking about that in this series, didn't we? Or maybe we already have. I don't know. Um, Or that you're traveling to Haiti next month and to Europe after that. There is within every human soul something insatiable, something this world cannot provide, nor will this life ever satisfy. I offer you a quote by C.S. Lewis who had a way of explaining things in fewer words with more meaning than I think any person in modern times. Here it is. If I find within myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. If I find within myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. I am. You are. These are longings in our soul that tell us that this world, this life, is not all there is. There is a heaven. There is an eternity. There is a future that will completely satisfy all of our unfulfilled dreams, desires, wants, and needs. You see, friends, unfulfilled desire is a continual reminder that this life is not the end game. And so that yearning that you feel, that discontentment in your souls, that longing that pierces your heart, that is your heart cry for God and your soul's deepest desire to be filled with all that God is. And until that day, whenever contentment settles in, Enjoy it. (laughs) Just enjoy it. And receive it as a gift from heaven itself. And when it doesn't, remind yourself that there is more, much more to come. There's a, a legend of a king who was suffering from a painful ailment whose astrologer told him that the only cure for him was to find a contented man get his shirt and wear it day and night. So the king's messengers were sent out throughout the king's realm in search of such a man with orders to bring back his shirt. Months passed, and after a thorough search of the kingdom, the messengers returned without a shirt. So the king asked them, did you not find a contented man in all my realm? His messengers replied, on the contrary, O king, we did find one such man, only one in your entire kingdom. Then why, demanded the king, did you not bring back his shirt? Master, the messenger said, we would have, but the man had no shirt. (laughs) I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether in plenty or in want. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. So that's all about all I have to say. on this subject for today, but I do have some phrases 
that I have found helpful to repeat to myself when faced with manipulative marketing designed to convince us that we need something newer, nicer, bigger, better, easier, faster, and so on. The first of these helpful phrases that I often say out loud to myself is this, enough is enough. Practice saying this line often, enough is enough. In fact, can you say it out loud with me right now? Enough is enough, good. Second phrase is this, the price is too high. Practice this as you walk around the malls of America or shop online. Please say this phrase out loud with me. The price is too high. Good. A third phrase is this. Who are you trying to kid? I mean, use this one when you know you are being conned by the media. Say it out loud with me. Who are you trying to kid? Good. Fourth phrase is this. You can't take it with you. This is a reminder that all our stuff is temporary and you will leave it all behind when you die. So say it out loud with me. You can't take it with you. Good. A fifth phrase is this. It doesn't have to be like this. It doesn't. I go around telling myself that all the time. Use this phrase to defy the mixed up values of our culture. We can choose to live differently. Let's say it out loud together. It doesn't have to be like this. And finally, God, fill my life with you. God, fill my life with you. By this we are saying, God, you are all I need. You are my life, be it my center. You are everything to me. Let's say it out loud together. God, fill my life with you. Let's pray. Father God, Fill my life with you. Fill my life with you. Fill my life with you. You are everything. You are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. You are the author of every good and perfect gift. You are our joy. You are our life. You are our every breath that we breathe. You are majesty. You are abundant life. You are the resource of everything that we have. You are the owner of everything that exists. All that we have and all that we are come from you. God, may we not lose sight of that. Forgive us, God, when we think our stuff is ours. Forgive us when we're selfish and greedy. Forgive us, Lord, when we pile up stuff that we no longer leave or need. Lord, forgive us for being stingy with our stuff. Teach us how to share. Teach us how to give back. Lord, remind us that when we share, we're just sharing your stuff with others. It's not ours. It's not going to last very long anyway. Lord, may we be generous givers. May we give with joy in our heart. May we learn what joy there is in giving back and growing your kingdom and building your church and lifting others up. Lord, what joy there is in this. And if we haven't discovered that, Lord, just place that in our heart. Just give us what it takes to do all things through you who gives us strength to give back and live that abundant life. Father, thanks for today. Thanks for these people. Thanks for this church. I thank you, God, that Fair Oaks Church exists right here, right now in this place, in this area to build up your kingdom and to exalt Jesus Christ and to spread his word and lead others to you. May that continue to be true here. Bless the staff, bless these dear folks, bless the volunteers. Um, Just build into them and encourage them uh, day by day, week by week, year by year. We love you, Lord. We give it all back to you in Christ's name we pray. Amen.